How have fear and fright evolved in video game mechanics? Ooh, Halloween, right me. Halloween is just around the corner, so that means dressing up in silly costumes and eating enough candy corn to make ourselves physically ill. But for gamers, it also means scaring the living bejesus out of ourselves with terrifying video games. Now scares are not unique to games. All mediums excel at giving you goosebumps in their own spine-tingling way. Music creates fearful atmosphere, photography changes the mood with lighting, and literature explores the inner monologue of fear. And then there's film. Over time, games have incorporated nearly all of the aforementioned ways to scare you, only now they're learning how to do them in their own way, which maybe makes them the most terrifying medium of all. Let's take a look at how games got to be so horrifying, beginning with when scary games weren't really that scary. The 1980s. Now we didn't have time to include every horror game that was ever made, but we tried to pick examples that really brought something innovative to the table. But if we missed a game that you really love, please let us know in the comments. So the horror game was basically invented with Haunted House for the Atari 2600. Sure, it was a bunch of blocks getting chased by other blocks through a maze of blocks, but it gets props for merely approaching the idea of horror in a way that we can sort of relate to. A lot of action games during that period were all about overpowering enemies. Pac-Man had power pellets, Mario had a sledgehammer. But Haunted House, on the other hand, put you in a position of constant vulnerability. You had no choice but to run away. That's why Haunted House is considered to be the progenitor of the survival horror genre. But clearly, the genre has come a long way since then. The next big evolution in video game horror was adding gore, pixelated gore, but gore nonetheless. Early horror games like Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and Splatterhouse were just like any other game, but they were important because they amped up the gore and the creepiness. Chiller was a gory light gun game where you could actually shoot the handles of a vice so that it would crush a guy's head which is ridiculous, but also disgusting. And disgust is really important for invoking fear. Psychologists have found a positive correlation between disgust sensitivity and symptoms of specific phobias, such as spider phobia, blood phobia, and small animal phobia. Moving on to the 1990s. The decade, not the, uh, the band. Doom not only introduced the scary first-person shooter, but also monster closets, which were an adaptation of the cinematic jump scare. The game would lure you into a room with a beautiful chainsaw gleaming on a pedestal, but when you grabbed it, you were dogpiled by demonic creatures, which is terrible. The Clock Tower series, inspired by the Italian slasher film Phenomena, had players react the way I would. You'd actually push the monsters away, run, and then hide under the bed, which sounds about right to me. And then came the pivotal survival horror game Resident Evil and it was supremely important. For one thing, it looked to outside sources for the feel and ambience, which we love to see here at Game Show. There's the zombie apocalypse of George Romero, the fixed camera perspectives of Hitchcock, and of course, the jump scares. But Resident Evil also did things that were totally idiosyncratic for games. As Clive Barker says, Horror shows us that the control we believe we have is purely illusory. Resident Evil's designers had these tricks, like save points that were few and far between, and ammo scarcity. This would make your hands tremble as you aimed your last bullet to kill a lurching zombie. Games had finally figured out that messing with players' means of interaction inside the game world led to terrifying uncertainty. Let's fast forward to the 2000s, or uh, um, the aughts. In Fatal Frame, you're exploring these creaky, Japanese mansions armed with nothing but a camera, which you're forced to look through, so you're really vulnerable and really uncertain. A similar mechanic works beautifully with Alien Isolation, with their locator doohickey that you have to look through, and it's really, really scary. Eternal Darkness really upped the crazy and the uncertainty with the introduction of the Insanity Meter. It was this ingenious mechanic that made you question whether that cockroach crawling on the screen was inside the game or if you were just seeing things. And as we all know, sound can be terrifying, but it's especially terrifying when it's tied to what we're doing in the game. So naturally, the sound designers of Dead Space placed fear emitters inside their enemy creatures so that the scary music swelled as they grew near. 
2010 game Amnesia The Dark Descent was a great example of using the mechanic of stealth, which was taken from games like Metal Gear. You had to open doors slowly and peek inside. This required you to play the game as if you were scared, like in real life, and you well should be, because you could run into this fella. Then we saw the stealth of Amnesia and the sound design of Dead Space combined in that chilling Last of Us sequence when you're sneaking past clickers who are asleep and they're still making that terrifying noise. And when you add all of these different mechanics together, the vulnerability, the fear of the unknown, the stealth, the monster closets, and so on, you can see why modern horror games like Alien, The Evil Within, and Outlast are pee your pants scary. Oh my god! And there's no reason to think that games won't continue down this pitch black path in the future. Something I'm personally terrified of and probably will never play are horror games in virtual reality. I mean, you're wearing a pair of isolating goggles. It's actually you inside an environment being chased by the boogeyman. It's way too real. No, no, no. <laughs> We did an episode about how virtual reality has real effects on your body, and that's why I think that VR horror has the potential to have the worst kind of fear, which according to the master of terror Stephen King, goes a little something like this. You feel something behind you, you hear it, you feel its breath against your ear, but when you turn around, there's nothing there. So what do you think? How are games unique in how they create fear? What are some of the scariest moments in games that you've played, and why? Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Oh, and happy Halloween. Last week we talked about satire, Team Fortress 2, and Far Cry 3. Let's see what you had to say. Or the Owl says that I missed a golden opportunity to talk about Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. Well, I didn't miss an opportunity to talk about it any more than I missed an opportunity to mention the fact that a dog dressed up like Ira Glass won the Fort Greene Halloween Dog Costume Contest this past weekend. But I digress. In any case, I don't necessarily think that Blood Dragon is a satire, particularly in the way that I define it in the episode, which is that satire identifies a particular wrong in society and then tries to send it up in a particular way. So Far Cry 3 is sort of satirizing not just first person shooters, but sort of millennial male culture. Um, and then Team Fortress 2, I mean, it's much more around violence and the conventions of a first person shooter. With Blood Dragon, I think you would be hard pressed to figure out what the wrong in society that it's attempting to make fun of. Maybe it's like cheesy 80s movies, which is a wrong, but maybe not quite on the same level. Gary Crasher, really liked the episode, thank you Gary, and wanted to know, uh, because I talked about satire, which is something that you would normally learn in English classes, when video games will be used in contemporary English classes. Well, I've talked to some teachers who have used different games to talk about different things, using The Walking Dead to talk about ethics, um, using Gone Home to talk about narrative devices like foreshadowing, and I think it's important to note that, you know, let's say a book like The Catcher in the Rye, which is read by most American students, wasn't necessarily written for educational purposes. It was repurposed by teachers who thought it was a great work of literature, and then it's taught to students, but the book itself was not meant to be a teaching manual, the same way that like a college textbook might be. So in that sense, then yeah, I absolutely think that video games could be used in an English environment to teach certain different types of uh, English conventions, whether it's poetry or, or narrative or structure or whatever it might be, so I sure hope so. Norbert Daniels isn't really sold that Far Cry 3 is the satire that I make it out to be. Well, you don't have to take my word for it. You can read interviews with Jeffrey Yoholem, the lead writer for the game. I'll link to some in the description. He's talked explicitly about how he wanted the game to be a send up of, uh, you know, a satire of contemporary male and masculine culture and first person shooters. Um, but if it didn't convince you, then yeah, that's fair enough. That's that's a fair opinion. Lit Crit also is not convinced about the satirical qualities of Far Cry 3, um, arguing that a real satire or strong satire weds its uh, satire to the work itself. First of all, anytime I see the words real in quotes before a particular term, it makes me think of Mike's No True Scotsman video, but regardless, I think you're making a good point. What you're identifying is something that game designers have called ludonarrative dissidence. It's a term that was coined by Clint Hawking, who is actually the lead designer for Far Cry 2. Specifically, it's when the story says one thing, but the gameplay itself says something entirely different. And that what you're saying is that Far Cry 3 positions its story as being a uh, 
satire of contemporary male culture and first-person shooters, but the mechanics are exactly the same as what you would find in a game like Call of Duty, for example. Uh, and I guess you could look at it two different ways. You could say the fact that the mechanics are exactly the same is exactly what they're trying to satirize with the little narrative twist at the end of the game, or that you're right, that it's not necessarily that strong. I tend to think it was intentional, that they tried not to buck uh, first-person shooter conventions too much to try and make their point, but yeah, I suppose there could be a universe in which you could do exactly the same thing narratively, but find a different way mechanically to express that idea. But Luxor doesn't necessarily think that Team Fortress 2 counts as satire. Specifically, um, this person finds the game to just be more funny, and that really the idea of positioning these uh, the characters in Team Fortress 2 as being nine to five, kind of like clock punching people, that doesn't necessarily feel like satire the same way. But I do think it has a lot of the critical elements in terms of the way that I define satire, specifically that it uses a lot of the conventions of a first person shooter, but puts kind of like turns them on its head. So the extreme violence, for example, extreme cartoonish violence, um, invisible walls, having a sign over where characters spawn that says do not enter. Um, regardless of whether or not it was Valve's intention to say, oh, we're really gonna blow, you know, blow a hole in this big first person shooter thing. I do think the game regardless carries the character Characteristics of being a satire, but hey, if you're not convinced, that's totally fine. It could just be a goofy shooter. That's totally cool, too.